Warning, the following message may be offensive to some audiences. These audiences may include, but are not limited to, professing Christians who never read their Bible, sissies, sodomites, men with man buns, those who approve of men with man buns, man bun enablers, white knights for men with man buns, homemakers who have finished Netflix but don't know how to meal plan, and people who refer to their pets as fur babies. Viewer discretion is advised. People are tired of hearing nothing but doom and despair on the radio. The message of Christianity is that salvation is found in Christ alone, and any who reject Christ, therefore, forfeit any hope of salvation, any hope of heaven. The issue is that humanity is in sin, and the wrath of Almighty God is hanging over our heads. They will hear his words, they will not act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment, when the fires of wrath come, they will be consumed and they will perish. God wrapped himself in flesh, condescended, and became a man, died on the cross for sin, was resurrected on the third day, has ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he sits now to make intercession for us. Jesus is saying there is a group of people who will hear his words, they will act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment come in that final day, their house will stand. Welcome to Bible Bash, where we aim to equip the saints for the works of ministry by answering the questions you're not allowed to ask. We're your host, Harrison Kerrig and Pastor Tim Mullet, and today we will seek to answer the age-old question, are people who are wounded by the church self-centered church shoppers who didn't get their way? Now, Tim, I think normally whenever someone's talking about anyone hurting anyone when it comes to the church and its members, normally it's the other way around where people are typically talking about how the church hurt them. So it might be kind of surprising for some people to hear us talking about uh, people actually hurting the church. So um, maybe let's just start by just addressing the title question head on, um, and and hopefully that'll kind of get people up to speed with what we're even talking about. Because I don't don't think most people even really have a category for – church members being anything other than uh, victims at, by the church's hand. So so why don't you go ahead and, and answer that question for us? Are people who are wounded by the church self-centered church shoppers who didn't get their way? Yeah, when you think about a question like that, we're obviously living in a victim society right now. So uh, right now, you know, pretty much uh, it's very popular in broader evangelical world to talk about deconversion stories and about you know, church abuse stories and, you know, the church hurt me and I need to take some time and, you know, detox myself from the church and (laughs) all this stuff and, you know, take a break and in order to heal and, you know, I just am damaged and broken and all this stuff. And so, you know, the standard um, uh, way that most people think about this kind of topic is fundamentally to think about the church, um, you know, always being uh, the one who's at fault in these kind of interactions. And so, uh, and then you combine that with just, you know, the standard um, right now pop psychological approach to victimization. And essentially, you know, you just, you believe the victim, you don't shame the victim, you don't blame the victim and everything else. And so, you know, as you think about something like that, when someone shares their experience, you know, their experience has to be validated. It has to be affirmed. It has to be, um, you know, basically um, considered to be true. And so you you basically have like a narrative that is used to uh, handle every single conceivable interaction between church members and church leaders and, you know, church as an organization or however you want to say. And, and typically the standard way that we view most of these encounters is to basically view them as uh, the church is fundamentally at, fault in every single one of these encounters and there's um, little to no tolerance for the opposite being actually considered as a valid option meaning you know you, you it might very well be that you're in an environment where um, you know do in large part I think to just the prevalence of mega church culture and seeker sensitive movement and you know, church shopper phenomenon in general, it, it might be that there's a wide variety of situations where you have self-centered church shopper people who really conceive of the church as being fundamentally all about them and their own desires and their own wants. And then they go into a, 
uh, you know, a church situation and basically try to impose all of their self-centered preferences on the church. And then, you know, when the church fails to, you know, live up to their expectations, then they, you know, basically cop a victim persona and, uh, basically, you know, then, um, adopt all the normal posture that comes with victimization. But I think it all kind of depends on where your location is in large measure. So like depending on what kind of church background you're from, but you know, in standard, you know, faithful church that's doing expositional preaching and, you know, doing its best to try to have some sort of regenerate church membership and, you know, not just filled with all the programs and everything else. I think, um, those kind of churches by and large, they get a lot of people who come in and they're coming from a church shopper background. And, and, you know, very often it, it is the case that you just have self-centered people coming into the church and causing a lot of problems with their own selfishness. And that's not an uncommon phenomenon at all. Uh, but then in different kind of traditions, it's, you know, it could be different stories. So there isn't a one size fits all, you know, approach to who's to blame in any one of these encounters. But I mean, right now, though, if you even ask the question, maybe it's, is it just the church member? You just, it's inappropriate to even ask at this point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Big time. You can't, uh, you cannot even, you know, um, even hint at the, the church member being involved, having any fault in the issue. Otherwise, you'll be labeled as a, you know, an insensitive monster, right? Right. I mean, but I could tell you story after story after story of, you know, situations I know where I just, you know, change the details a little bit and, you know, not give out any names. But I mean, I, I can just tell you story after story, situation after situation where, you know, you have church members who just, you know, they are coming into a church situation or, you know, they've been there for a while and they get their heart set on something and they're just, you know, unwilling to consider like the possibility that they might just be, you know, being entitled brats about something, you know? So, I mean, I, I just reminded of a you know situation where a girl felt like the Lord was telling her to lead a female Bible study at the church. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a scenario where she really, you know, felt like God was telling her this, like somehow, like, you know, in, um, in her, in her feelings. And the problem was, I mean, it's just like, she's just not the kind of girl that anyone at the church would think would even want her to do a Bible study. So no one showed up. Right. So no one showed mm -hmm. up to her Bible study because it's like, no one recognized her as like having the gift of teaching or, you know, being, um, in any way, like someone that individuals would want to go to, uh, for that. But then no one showed up. And then it's just like, uh, then she feels like she's hurt by the church because church leadership didn't want to promote it. But it's just like, you know, like you're not someone that the leadership at that church felt like was qualified to be in a teacher role. And, you know, what do you do in that kind of scenario of your church leaders? You just let anyone and everyone start a Bible study. You promote it. You basically put pressure on everyone to go to it when you don't think you're going to be getting anything good. And then no one really wants to show up. And then it's, well, it's your fault for not supporting me. And then, you know, you fall into the standard victim narrative that, that you're been hurt by the church and abused by the church. And it's just like, Hey, maybe it's a little more complicated than that. And, <laughs> you know, maybe God didn't tell you that, you know, <laughs> like maybe you made that up, you know, and maybe, maybe like few should become teachers because they'll receive a stricter judgment and maybe there's qualifications for that and maybe you don't fit, you know? And so, and that's leaving aside, you know, what kind of um, church structure you have in general and what kind of expectations you have as it relates to those kind of things. But, you know, that kind of individual couldn't conceive of the fact that there might be any reason why the church wouldn't support that other than just, them failing her and letting her down and not listening to the Holy Spirit and all that. So, but I mean, that's not uncommon. That's just standard fare, you know? I don't know, Tim. I don't know. But to me, that just sounds like the church hurting another victim. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, church <laughs> just threw another one under the bus. You know, I mean, refused to utilize their gifts and, the <laughs> 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 you know, uh, didn't support them and, you know, um, to support their sense of calling and you know but i mean it's just like church is messy man like it's just like there's situations like that that you just like 
what do you do? You know, like, yeah, you really are caught in, in between a rock and a hard place. Cause you either, like you said, you either, uh, you know, go along with it and, and then, you know, it goes down in flames because that's not their gifting, you know? And, and, and so it inevitably just <laughs> gets, gets torched. Um, or you say no on the front end and, and save all that heartache on the back end, but then you've got to deal with the, well, you don't want to, you don't want to support me and you know, whatever, whatever. Or you hate women. You don't, you, know, you hate women. Hate you don't think, you don't think they need to teach no matter what or. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's all that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, there's just, I mean, scenario after scenario that I can think of and, you know, churches I've been to and been a part of, you know, or, you know, the, the guy with an ax to grind at the church who didn't get the job that he wanted, you know, and now is just deeply troubled by the direction of the church, you know, wants to mm-hmm. start like a prayer group or whatever. But then like when you let him pray one time in the congregation, he threw everyone under the bus and complained about it, you know, <laughs> and then it's just like, he wants to start a prayer group and you don't support it. And it's just like, well, I guess you're anti-prayer, you know, it's just like, well, well, ob- I mean, obviously you're anti-prayer. <laughs> I mean, he's like, praying over all these issues that he sees in the church and you're trying to shut that down. Yeah, Come on. <laughs> all those issues which seem to, you know, personally have affected him. And then, you know, but it's just, it's like, there's so like, you know, if you were to listen, like you can listen to the narrative and the Bible says the first to plead their case seems right until another one comes along to examine it. So you can listen to those kind of narratives and, and like it, it sells, you know, and there's a market for it. Um, you know, I mean, there's a market to destroy the church in that kind of way and paint everyone as victims. But then, oh yeah. but then like the problem is if you, you know, you often can't tell the other side of the story you know, you you just can't like you can't just it, you set everyone down and explain. You know, this is like mm. like what what the thought process is, and so there's a lot of situations like that you just have to take. But then, yeah, you know, but then it's just one of those things where it, it's like it's just a, a lot of times life is much more complicated than that. And then when you have like church shopper culture that, that essentially breeds the type of individual who thinks that the church is fundamentally all about them and supporting them and validating them and, you know, everything else, then like you're, you know, you're in a situation where a lot of people like they just go from church to church, you know, and until they muster up the courage to basically, you know, finally tell the church their deepest desires, you know, and they put them out there like a, you know, um, like that dish that they labored over for 12 hours, you know, hoping that you would enjoy it, you know, kind of thing. And it's just like, man, we can't support that. And then it's just like, oh, how dare you? You just rejected all of me, you know, <laughs> like, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, and at that point, it's just like, how can they possibly face to be in your presence anymore when you just totally rejected everything, you know, that it took them all this courage to share you know but i mean it's just there's i mean there's just so many situations that i know about personally and have heard about and been you know in tangential ways and like i just it's just more complicated than that and there's no simple answer to like there's no simple answer to that and an accusation doesn't constitute proof you know right you have to like um and you have to hear both sides of the story and, and you know often it's just like there's reasons why you can't share everything too yeah, that remi- I'm I'm reminded a lot. Uh, it it does seem like it is um, really popular to try and take down the church and try and air out the church's dirty laundry all the time. I think I what comes to mind immediately is is probably John MacArthur and and his church. And it seems like, uh, especially these days, it seems like there's some sort of you know claim against them like once every three months it feels like now and it's funny because it seems like it kind of comes from the same people over and over yeah, I again mean, julie roy's is doing one a week you know <laughs> yeah. uh, desperately hoping that something will stick, stick to the wall um yeah i mean and it's crazy i mean it's crazy i mean you have a church like what what's silly about it is like you have a church like that where i think he's been the pastor there for over 40 years going on 50 years now mm-hmm. and it's like you, you know you like you can't tell me that like in the course of, you know, 50 years of being a pastor and doing ministry that it's like not conceivably possible that maybe perhaps there was one situation that came up along the line where they 
could have hand, handled it a little better if they had more information that they weren't privy to in the moment. You know, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. just, it's like, even if, you know, I mean, like, so there's like, you know, there's scenarios where you don't like, you don't have enough information to know how to proceed. You know, a lot of the accusations go along those lines. And there are situations where, like, even with the information you have, you may, like, didn't pick the wisest outcome. And it's open to criticism later on. But my goodness, like, I mean, in thousands and thousands of pastoral interactions over the years, if you're scraping the bottom of the barrel and trying to find some sort of dirt on someone that happened 20 years ago, and that's the best that you can do, it's just like, you have a problem, you know? (laughs) Right, right. You know, and with, you know, individuals like Julie Royce, I mean, her agenda is she hates like biblical gender roles and, you know, John MacArthur is an example of that. And she's actively trying to destroy him for those reasons, because she feels like she's a woman who's called to preach. And, you know, he told Beth Moore to go home. And so now she doesn't like him and she's trying to figure out any way she can possibly can to destroy his reputation. But I mean, those are dime a dozen. And, you know, a lot of these stories you have to understand there's other agendas that are behind these things that you don't hear about you know and so you can't just take the accusation at face value what's motivating it right and so and there's false accusations that come in plenty of situations but what is right. it, what is it about you know and and often you know just in life it's not always about the thing that they're talking about you know it's, it's often about something else like there's something else motivating it but yeah i think um I've had plenty of uh, personal interactions as well where I've met, you know, we're in a college town, so we meet, we meet, you know, new young students every year. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard them uh, tell me that, that at some point in their life, the church hurt them along the way. And, and, and that's probably one of the top, you know, two or three reasons why they if they aren't in church right now that's one of the top reasons why they aren't uh in church right now they so they might some of them say well hey i just haven't found a place but it's like you know they're a junior in college and it's like what do you mean <laughs> what do you mean you haven't found a place it's been 3 years but a lot of them they do say hey look the church hurt me in some way and i'm i'm basically they're still not over it and a lot of it's a weird situation to be in because as a person who's being told this, you don't really have a lot of info to go off of. And so they're kind of, sometimes they're, they're ready to just like put it all out there for you. And, and they kind of expect you to just form your entire opinion on the whole situation based around that. And there's been a few, there's been a few interactions where I, I've had to say like, Oh wow. You know, if that's true, that's bad. But, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to like comment because I don't know everything. I wasn't there. I wasn't there for the conversations. And that's kind of like, they'll, they'll kind of take that as like an assault, <laughs> you know, on, on, the, on themselves. Me just saying like, Hey, I'm going to kind of like judgment. try, try and, and stay neutral here <laughs> and say, you know, like if that is exactly what happened, then yeah, that's really bad. That's but, you re-victimizing them in the moment, you know? Right. Right. And, and, um, so it seems like it's uh, really popular to um, have an experience like that, and and there's really not any fear to even just like air it all out for everyone, you know. And and it's kind of like you you want everyone, you want as many people as possible um, to hear it, well, what's, to, what's, to know about it. Yeah, I mean the the thing what what's motivating it in a lot of cases is you have individuals who are not like connected to a church right now. And they need some sort of rationale to explain their functional apostasy, essentially. So the Bible says they went out from us because they were not of us, but they left that it might be demonstrated that they are not of us. Now, like the only way to get out of that, you know, and to like when you're the person who's neglecting to meet together as is the habit of them, you know, like like when you're that person who is treading dangerous ground, then what you need is you need some story that puts you in like the, the position of the victim in order to make it all make sense. Because right now, I mean, you're living in a society that basically, if you claim the victim status, like there's no, um, like no, there's no accountability for you whatsoever. Right. You get immediate affirmation. You get like instantaneous, like Catholic church sainthood, you know, 
like once you claim that victim label, that's what you get, you know? But then the, the problem though is that like in case after case after case, like, you know, when you really think about what they're actually saying and like, you know, often it's just like, you know, like I was on the media team or something and, you know, and I uh, kept on not showing up. And then like, you know, the person basically asked me to commit to showing up when I'm on the schedule or like quit, like just step down from the role, you know, right. and it's just like, how dare you, you know, uh, not, you know, understand that, you know, I'm a, like a college student who, you know, is unreliable at this point in my life and I'm going through things emotionally and mm -hmm. don't know how to process, you know, things. So, so I mean, it's, it's often like things like that, or it's often like, you know, like stories of like, um, you know, some sort of church discipline process that was started, you know, whether or not it was just someone confronting them of some sort of sin in their life. You know, often it's not, doesn't even go near the third step. It's often just the first step kind of things that are just basic individuals trying to encourage like accountability in their life to some degree. Like, hey, you know, you might not want to, you know, dress with a see-through shirt on, you know, or something like right. that. You know, just basic kind of stuff like, uh, like that, you know, that, you know, it's just like, how dare you? Or, you know what, you're dating someone and they're not a believer, you know, and they're a drug addict. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> like they never go to church. They like, they're like, they use recreational marijuana every week. You know, they're obviously high every time I'm talking to them, you know, and it's just like, like, have they ever, like, they don't have a spiritual thought in their brain. You know, the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. You know, it's that kind of thing or it's like, you know, you're spending the night at your boyfriend's house every week. You know, can, we need to have a conversation about it. It's like, how dare you? You know, uh, that is so, I mean, but then like the thing is, it's like the, the scandal is that like that victim label became the excuse that validated their sin. Right. Mm hmm. And you take it away and it's like all that's left is just, oh, like I'm I'm the one to blame here, you know? And it's like people can't, like they don't process that. I mean, that's just the way that relationships work. You always are looking for someone to blame for your problems, you know? Right. And like once you get that, then you get this all-purpose excuse to basically not deal with life anymore. You know? Yeah. So – when it comes to, you know, say, say you're in that situation where you meet the person who is saying, Hey, you know, I'm a victim. Look at how the church hurt me. Um, should we, if we want to, if we want to honor God, should we, uh, immediately believe them <laughs> as a victim? <laughs> well, the, the issue is like, uh not whether or not we believe victims. The issue is who's the victim, right? So like, so like I, I want to believe the victim. The question is, who is it? You know, is it you? Mm -hmm. Like, are you the victim? Are you the villain in this scenario? And, you mm -hmm. know, often like life is a little more complicated than that. Often like we're all of us victims in certain ways and villains in certain ways. And life doesn't seem to divide up so neatly like that as if like the, like, you know, every person you're, dealing with is like Anne Frank and then the person that they're accusing is Hitler, you know, like <laughs> often it's, yeah, little, it's not all Jedi and Sith. Huh? I mean, it's, it's not, you know, and it's like, it's often like, uh, like even in situations where like the individual has a le legitimate like beef, you know, <laughs> uh, with, with the, the other, like uh, there's, it's, it's more complicated than that. And they probably fail to handle, like how to deal with like they probably didn't suffer very well and weren't very you know long suffering and weren't very patient and humble and you know everything else so it's just complicated you know so like the issue is not whether or not we believe victims it's who is it but then the bible tells us the first to plead their case seems right until another comes to examine it and like when you're listening to one side of the story like there has never ever been a situation where i've listened to one side of a story and then not and then got the other side and the other side wasn't incredibly illuminating, right? Mm -hmm. Like I've never been in that scenario. And you know, being involved in counseling, you know, I you know, you can hear you can listen to the woman, like, and it's like, man, she's just like like messed up and like this guy is a horrible monster and you know, just you know, Satan incarnate. And then you listen to the guy and it's just like, oh wow, like 
Uh, I get it. Yeah, that's a little more complicated than what you're making it out. And then you listen to the guy and it's like, she's like literal, you know, just a vicious life sucking, sucking abyss from which there's no escape, you know? And then you listen to her and it's just like, yeah, you know what? Like he comes home every day and, you know, plays on his phone for, you know, eight hours. And then like, then he wants to, you know, have sex with me at three in the morning, you know? After he ignored me all day long, it's like, dude, right. what's your, what's your problem? You know, <laughs> right? You know, but it's just like that's the way it works. You know, even in these church situations where you know, like even when there's like some sort of like, you know, kernel of truth there, it's just uh, it's a lot more complicated. So yeah, I mean, I, I think what you have to do is you have to suspend some sort of you know judgment, um, you know, and often you can ferret it out pretty easily, like in those kind of things by saying, hey, you know. Um, like, could you mind if I go talk to your church about it and get their side of the story? <laughs> yeah, I think if you want to see like a really bad example of what could happen if you just immediately believe the first side that you hear is just look at this, you know, Amber Heard Johnny Depp court case going on right now. I mean, I mean, for a while there, everyone was ragging on Johnny Depp because uh, you know Amber Heard came along and and was essentially insinuating that that uh depp was you know beating her and uh, abusing her verbally and physically and then and then here we are now and it's like everyone's kind of everyone's kind of acting like they were never on amber amber's side to begin with you know because because it's you're finally getting a lot of um you know over the last year or so however long it's been you've been getting a lot of of johnny depp side and all of a sudden it's like oh whoa this is not what Amber Heard made it out to sound like, you know. So, so it seems like if you want, if if you want any sort of extra biblical sort of example of, you know, not believing the first person that claims victim status, then just look at this court case going. Well, I mean, and look I, at I, all the police shootings too. I mean, the police shootings are also examples of, of that right. kind of thing. To where, like, like the problem is that like once the narrative is set, then. Like, you know, liter literally, it's just like, you know, hands up, don't shoot, you know, Michael Brown, that kind of stuff. And it's like, mm -hmm. you know, the forensic evidence shows that he had gunpowder on his hand. You know, how does he get a gunpowder on his hand? Right. You know, and there's, you know, evidence that he you know, charged the police officers, bashing his head in. It's just like, you know, like there's two sides to every story. And one of the things that we have to do, even like almost especially in an age that has like video evidence is, like there's been situations where you just like you see a clip, you see a brief moment and you jump to a conclusion. It's just like you got to hold off a little bit. But then, it, it, you know, th that's especially true with you're just dealing with testimony, you know, like there these narratives are already set. So like the narrative is set that the church is just this monstrous, you know, abuser of its authority. And people are ready to believe that and hear that. And and part of what's happening is that like you're living in a. Uh, culture and society right now that basically hates all authority and mm -hmm. and a lot of like the the abuse like uh claims are coming from like a culture that is hostile to the very idea of authority across the board and so that's a lot of what's happened in the church too movement me too movement all that is you have like like a narrative that all authority is bad and then like it's by definition bad. And so then the church is, has authority structures within it. And so you have like people who are just jumping to conclusions, but then like the Johnny Depp, Amber Heard thing, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where it's the, like, it's just a, a great example. Like what you're talking about, the first to plead their case seems right until another one comes along to examine it. And, you know, like there's obviously like two sides to every story and, you know, you can selectively portray certain bits and pieces of a story and not have the full picture. And it just shows you that like, you know, if you give an answer before you're here, it's folly and shame. Like that you have to like be patient and listen to both sides. And, you know, if, if, uh, if a lot more pastor, like what happens a lot of times is pastors, they don't want to do the work of like actually getting the other side of that story. And then what mm -hmm. happens is the disgruntled church member goes to their church and they're the next like victimizer, you know, like, and it's just like, it, but really what's happening is you have like, a, in a lot of cases, like individuals who are just like, 
doing, they're doing the same thing they do in their own marriages and their own relationships. You know, it's just, it's all about them and it's about what they want, you know, and they go into a relationship and it's just like, you know what? Like she doesn't, you know, respond to my every desire exactly the way I want. You know, she doesn't live up to all my fantasies and, you know, and everything else. And so I, I can't trust her and she, you know, wounded me and all that. And then on the other end, it's just like, he's not loving me well. And, you know, anticipating flawlessly all my desires and needs and knowing, you know, at any given moment, exactly what I want and invalidating all my feelings. And, you know, you take that into a church and like you've learned to do that in relationships. And it's the same thing that's happening at the church level is it just now it's like, you know, the church who is not validating their desires and giving them everything they want and doing everything that, you know, idea that they have and you just have a mess. Right. Um, and I think when it comes to, you know, we, we've been talking about, it's really popular, uh, to claim victimhood status and, and people are kind of, they're jumping at the, at the chance really to, right. to claim it for themselves, get that, get that, um, coveted label, you know, man. coveted label. Um, but doesn't it seem like it's kind of a, a sissy thing to do? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't, don't you think of like if a guy came along and, and, and I, I, I know some people like this who, uh, guys who are constantly like everybody's out to get me. And, and I always kind of think like, man, that's a little sissy, isn't it? <laughs> do they need that what is that guy's name jesse uh um or jesse lee peters or jesse what is the guy's name who the the black dude uh that uh, uh oh i i don't know you've mentioned him before, beta, I the one who's always name. saying beta, <laughs> beta. <laughs> beta. Uh, no i mean it it is it's very emasculating to be that kind of person who's just like uh you know everyone hurt me and everyone everybody's out to get everyone's me everyone's out to get me and everyone's so mean to me and it's just like it's it's emasculating yes it's like like even in situ i mean i just i don't know man i've been in churches that i thought like they got some problems, man, you know, but it is like that's not my impulse you know I've been in situations where you know, I've been under leaders that I thought, hey, they're not qualified to be a pastor. They need to step down, you know, everything else. Mm-hmm. And they're not handling things well. They're, you know, they're like, I don't know what they're doing, you know, but there was never in my mind this thought like this is like I'm wounded and I'm hurt and I'm not validated. And I've, I've been in situations where like I've been like qualified to teach and not being utilized by with my gifts and but i have no expectation that i'll be used like i consider it like a privilege (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. like you know i've been in those situations and there's no expectation that you're going to give me some position and give me some like who am i i'm nobody you know if god wants me to have like a a a way to be useful then he'll make me useful just like you know if there's situations where i can be helpful be helpful i'll just look to serve like in the ways that you'll let me like, you know, picking up chairs and moving them and doing, you know what I mean? Like that, that's right. kind of my attitude about it. You know, I mean, and, and I, you know, there's like, you know, I could tell you about a church I was at where they had like a lady, yeah, uh, like there, this church, right. I was at, and like one day I discovered that after I already joined it, that there is a older lady who was leading like an adult Sunday school class full of mm-hmm. all the deacons in the church. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I went and I talked to the pastor about it. And I said, like, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and his answer to that was, you know, we're just going to let this one die off, you know? And I, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to let this one die off. <laughs> I just thought, oh, what a wimp, man. What a wimp. You know, like, all right. Hey, what do you want me to do? They'll call me a woman hater if I shut it down. Uh, like, you know, but like the way I responded to that was just, I thought, all right, I'm not going to cause a big stink about this. I'm not going to like try to destroy this place. It's just like, I'm going to find a new church, right, man? I No hard feelings. You let it die off. I just can't. 
follow that, you know? <laughs> but I mean, I didn't think to myself, oh man, I was wounded and I was damaged and, you know, everyone's going to, like, I have to justify myself and like, I Dude, have that was a golden opportunity, man. man. I didn't you should have jumped at it. I didn't go there with it, you know? It's just like, <laughs> there's no, like, why would you go, like, what do you, like, I just don't get it. Like, there's churches that are unfaithful, you know, and you try to pr- help them be faithful, but if they don't want to listen, you shake the dust off your feet and, you know, you take, Find somewhere that's going to be solid, you know, and you don't have to turn it into this big old, I'm wounded, I'm damaged, like I put myself out there. It's like, I just, I don't get that. Like, I, I don't get that kind of mentality. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, it's not like masculine, like in, you know, and like the guys that are doing that, they're doing that because they don't have, I don't even know what it means to be a man. Like, and, you know, big surprise, like the ladies in their life don't want to like be intimate with them is because they're a pansy, you know? Right. Like, and it's just like, I mean, even that, even that terminology it's yeah. like really kind of weak and sissy like you know like i'm weak i'm weak i'm damaged oh. i'm you know i'm i'm broken <laughs> i can't even i can't even say them all because they're so i think oh, that, i think so gonna get when people a, use that when people <laughs> use those words this is like a you know i'm pulling back the curtain a little bit when people start <sighs> using those words and they're not being like um you know facetious or sarcastic or something I have one of two responses. The first one is to just like totally roll my eyes, you know, and think like this is the dumbest thing ever. Like, like you're being a sissy, you know. The second one is just to to just like cringe as hard as I can. Basically, yeah. I think like because the words themselves, the words themselves are just so like. No, it's like you know weak, confessing that you have a therapeutic peacock or something, and like in order to do it, like it's like whoa, like they're, they're we're really there, you know, we're there. <laughs> the therapeutic uh, we're, peacock. We're that's where we are, you know. But I mean, like part of well, part of what's happened is you're living in a matriarchal society, and like men haven't been taught like these basic kind of temperance and you know control of their emotions and fortitude, and like they, you know, they they really like they haven't been trained to have control over their emotions. You know, they've, they've been taught that like in order to be a man, you have to express your emotions just like a woman might. And, and so then like, but that's like, whatever that is, it's not like being strong. It's not being courageous. It's not acting like men. It's not like strength. It's not courage. It's not mm-hmm. any of that. It's like, it's like, like it's, um, it's like a surrender of all the masculine virtues when you start speaking that way. And it's like, don't, I mean, and there's a reason why, like, you you shouldn't expect any sympathy from that. Like, you should expect people to say, hey, man up, you know, like, get control of yourself. You know, because if you can't even handle, like, like mild pushback on your ideas, like, you can't handle those kind of situations, how are you going to do anything that, like, the Bible actually calls a man to do? You know, like, the zombie apocalypse comes and you're reduced to tears because the zombies are hurting your feelings. Like, what in the world? Like, you know, like, we need you to, like you know, get out your club here and, <laughs> and go to work, you know, like that's what we right. need. Like, and, and so, I mean, like I, I find it repulsive and repelling, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, you ought, you ought to obviously like have compassion on people who are caught up in that kind of thing. But like, like what we, we don't need to normalize that as like a normal manly response to dealing right. with conflict. Like if you can't, right. Like, like, you know, part of like these church issues, like it's about dealing with conflict, you know, it's about like, um, learning how to like interact in difficult situations with difficult people who, you know, and I just, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, for me, I just, I've never had those kind of expectations. Like I've always been humbled and thought like, man, if yeah, I, I've gone into every church I've been at since I became a Christian and I basically say, Hey, I'm. You know, if there's any way I can be useful, then I'd like to be useful, you know? And, right. And um, and if they didn't give me anything to do, I'd find things to do, you know? Like, no one's going to complain if you help take up chairs and do things like that. And, like, you know, you can find a way to be useful if you want to. But, like, I've, I've just never approached church, like, in a way that I've just, like, thought to myself, like, man, like, you know, um, you need to validate me and, like they like you don't you know <laughs> I don't, I don't. right that's not training up masculinity when you're thinking that way and and this is kind of going off topic but you know you see everyone kind of makes fun of of the you know uh the masculine guys who are kind of always saying like 
they they never you know open up about anything and and maybe there's a little bit of validity to that but then we've pushed things so far the other way that we've we're essentially training men to be as effeminate as as humanly possible which is really bad for us because you know now everyone's everyone's coming after the church with with um all the lgbtq stuff the uh the abortion stuff um uh you know a lot of the the like what's it I, why am i blanking on the word the uh uh environmental stuff that's going on covid all of these different things and and the church really has to take a stand and be able to say things like hey no the government can't just shut down our churches uh we have a right to gather you know um no you can't you can't take our kids and teach them how to have you know gay sex right, <laughs> right? right. uh but but if if you're training people to use this kind of language and think this kind of way think that victim uh victim status is something to be desired then you're never going to have men that actually stand against those things well because that's going to be mean and hurtful and harmful but no one like the thing is i think it's like no one wants a pastor who is like doing that himself doing what i mean no one wants a pastor who's just like fussing and complaining like no one loves me and no one treats me well and they don't you know care about me and they you know always fight everything that I'm trying to do and woe is me and Eeyore. And Mm -hmm. so no one expects, like when you see that, I've seen pastors go that route and it's just like, man, it's like, this is really odd, you know, like, cause that's just like, like, Hey man, like man up and have courage and show us an example of what it looks like to suffer well. Right. And that's what people expect out of a pastor. And if like you you get up every week and the pastor's just fussing about no one loves me and no one cares about me and you know everyone's mistreating me and misrepresenting me and you know I'm just wounded and I'm damaged and I need to go take a sabbatical because I'm so stressed out and it's just like like there's nothing that like results in like a vote of no confidence like that. But then like the thing is like the pastor is an example to the flock and. So if that's weird for a pastor, that should be weird for men too. You know, that that should be weird. And it's just like no one, like like the thing is, like you think about how society actually works and society actually functions. Like when the men are strong and they handle difficulty well, everyone else can handle difficulty well and mm-hmm. be strong. You know, so like you can go through some very hard times if the men have courage and have strength and, you know, uh, have fortitude and, and don't you know take everything like so personally and turn into an emotional mess of tears you know like when they don't get everything they want like like you can you can go through very tough times because they're, you're looking to like your leaders to be an example of uh, of strength right but when they go then everyone goes you know and so we're in a situation now where all the men have basically like turned into wimps and then, like, there's no example of, like, well, what does it look like to handle criticism, you know? Right, have, like, have thick skin. Yeah, I mean, there's, like, right now, like, in church society, like, you, 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 the standard church member at the standard church, you know, you know, it, basically, if they have one person, like, criticize them, like, they literally don't ever want to see that person again and feel perfectly justified in avoiding them and never thinking about them and never talking to them again. Like we're that thin skinned, you know, as a society. Mm -hmm. And so then it's just very hard to look at, you know, all these stories of abuse and wounding and actually hear them out. And it's like, most of them are pretty petty, you know, like, and pretty like, um, I mean, they're they're not what you think they are, you know? So, right. Uh, So, but isn't it, you know, maybe some people are hearing what we're saying and, and uh they might be thinking well okay like sure maybe maybe a lot of people err on the side of the church member every single time but it kind of seems like you guys are just wanting to err on the side of the church every single time isn't it possible that the church can actually do things that you know harm its members right, yeah that's two two kind of uh two responses to that so like the okay. idea of First, erring, which side do you err on, right? 
Right. Uh, so right now we we're told, like I said, as a, as a demand, you err on the side of the member, right? Right. Well, the problem is the Bible says you don't receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. So the Bible doesn't go that route, right? Mm-hmm. Like so, there is a like you like there is a biblical principle to say, you know, godly men and godly church you give them the benefit of the doubt, and you need you know testimony of more than just one person. You know, one accusation doesn't a guilty verdict render in that way. So that would be a scriptural like pr- position there, right? Now, like meaning, like if there's a you know preference, uh, if there's a you know way do you, where do you lean? Typically, you lean towards the, you know, the church. Um, okay, is where you lean, biblically speaking, right? You know, you don't receive an accusation except on the evidence of two or three witnesses. That's like that tells you where to lean, like your sympathies. But then, like you know, um, basically, this f- the the substance of the question though is: Aren't there real situations where churches are, you know, you use a loaded term, abusive, right? Mm-hmm. All right. Well, yes. <laughs> I mean, that, that it's just a horrible term. Uh, maybe I'll give you three responses. So one, like <laughs> the the abusive stuff is just a horrible term. I mean, like right now, like you know, um, like. The word, like when you talk about, you know, someone abusing someone, it can mean anywhere from like the guy, you know, beats his wife with a chainsaw every night uh, to like, (laughs) um, to like something as trivial as, you know, the wife is like literally screaming in her husband's face and spit is dribble, you know, dripping out of her mouth as she is berating him and a spit droplet falls into his eye as she's berating him for the 10th time that night. And he you know, shoves her away from him, right? And mm-hmm. it's just like, those are two very different scenarios, all right? Like, right. you know, like those are, I mean, we even like think about like verbal abuse, right? Verbal abuse as a category that now, like if if someone verbally abuses you, meaning like even as much as like fails to agree with you or slightly raises your voice, then that's calls for divorce in the minds of many people. You know, so like any like any time that word is used, it's just so charged. You don't even know what it means, right? You have no idea what that word means, but once it's put out there, it's like you have to believe the person and sympathize with them. And it's just like, what are we talking about? You know, are we talking about the chainsaw incident? Are we talking about the like? Are we talking about like you know after you know yelling and screaming at someone, someone slightly raises their voice and says, "You need to calm down." You know, like mm-hmm. like yeah. what are we saying? You know, so like put that into like the discussion like that's just a word that's unhelpful that we should put a moratorium on and probably never use like it just use different words that are more helpful you know what are we talking about you know uh so but you know leaving that all aside i think as you read the bible one of the things you'll find is like oh like there's different you know there's errors that can go both ways so um meaning like you know as you think through like I was, I was listening to numbers this week and uh, it's really amazing like how many times the Israelites challenge Moses leadership unjustly. Mm-hmm. Like it's just over and over and over again. It's from the very beginning of the story, you know, in Exodus, you know, when you get to numbers, it's like you have the rebellion of Korah, you have Miriam and Aaron who are essentially, you know, um, uh, saying, you know, is it only to you to whom God has spoken Moses, right? He didn't, he also speak to us and God basically takes Moses aside in the case of Miriam and Aram, giving Miriam leprosy uh, in order to shame her, you know, and cause her to go outside the camp and the rebellion of Korah, you know, God causes the ground to open up and swallow like those individuals bringing those accusations against Moses. But, mm-hmm. but, you know, as you think about it, like Paul, you know, Moses, all the faithful guys, like they were all falsely accused you know, Jesus says, like, of his followers, like, if they spoke evil of me, they're going to speak evil of you. A servant's not greater than his master. Like, you know, if they malign me, they're going to malign you. Like, you know, in Paul, throughout his whole ministry, had threats from the outside, threats from the inside, super apostles, false prophets, you know, everything else, like church members, like, you know, it's just, that's just the nature of the beast. And so it's that way. But then, like, you also have plenty of examples in the Old Testament of, like, you know, when the pre- when the kings go bad, you know, when Eli's sons go bad and start, you know, robbing people and sleeping with women and, you know, and then you have examples in first John of like situations where, um, essentially, 
if, you know, you have these leaders or in the epistles of John where you have leaders who are kicking people out of the church unjustly and everything else. So, I mean, it can go either way. I think depending on your faith tradition, these things can, um, uh, you know, I'm using that squishy expression, but you know, you know what I mean? Like depending on the kind of church you're in, the errors go in different ways to, so like in your standard, like charismatic prosperity church, you know, I'm much more, you know, sympathetic to those kind of things in general, right? Mm -hmm. Like in those kind of scenarios, like I understand what we're talking about, you know, like in terms of just, uh, you know, the man with the anointing that no one can challenge and like uh, that uh, is motivated by greed and everything else. But there's other things that are feeding into that kind of basic distrust of the scenario too, you know, uh, like the fact that he's receiving direct divine revelation and he's teaching a false gospel, you know, right. so it's not shocking that there are some other crazy stuff going on too. Uh, but, you know, I, I think like in, in your standard, like mega church culture, part of the thing is like, you're just standard mega church culture is really, t you know, training people to be self-centered, petty church shoppers. And, and I think probably most of your standard big church scenarios, probably what's happening is that guys aren't just, you know, like they probably don't, deserve all the flack they're getting but it's just like when you train people that church is all about them and you have like thousands of people who think that this thing's all about them at some point you're in an impossible situation because the church can't be about you know a thousand different individuals <laughs> right like something's got to give you know like and that's kind of the way it works and so i but then what's happened is i think you have a lot of like you know faithful churches who are basically picking up you know the church shopper stuff and then getting a lot of bad example, getting a lot of the same kind of self-centered, you know, me first kind of stuff. And so I think that's by and large what's happening in the main, but then there are like, you know, there are real situations where, uh, you know, people are um, uh, using their power and authority irresponsibly and those things happen for sure. So shouldn't, shouldn't we just expect the church to just like come out and be like, Hey, sorry. You know, like if Moses had just said sorry, you know, to to Miriam, wouldn't wouldn't that have? Don't you think? I mean, maybe she wouldn't it, have huh? had to get leprosy, you know, or if, if he had just said sorry to the sons of Korah, like maybe the ground wouldn't have swallowed him up. <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> that we hurt you, you know. I mean, but that's like, the that's the expectation. Or, or even you know, Mac MacArthur like coming out yeah. and just saying, "Hey, look, you know what." Just, sorry. just, just say bad. you're sorry, man. Just say you're sorry. My bad. Their feelings are hurt, you know. That, that one's on me. That one's on me, guys. Yeah. You know, pat, pat your chest a little bit. <laughs> yeah, part of part of the thing is we just don't believe people are responsible for their feelings is part of the problem. And so then, but but the issue is like we, the Bible says that we're responsible for even how we think and even how we feel. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, when uh, Cain was mad at God for not accepting his sacrifice, God looked at him and he said, you know, why are you angry and why is your face fallen, right? So Cain, like, Cain, God didn't accept his sacrifice and so Cain starts to pout, right? And God mm -hmm. didn't just say, hey, sorry, you know, I'm sorry I hurt your feelings, Cain, you know, like I understand how, you know, you could think that that was kind of mean, but you have to understand, you know, I have rules that you have to follow, you know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that, that isn't what he did, you know, and like he, you know, why are you angry? Why are your face is falling? You know, and like, uh, if you do well, will you not, will not your sacrifice be accepted? And the same thing with Jonah. I mean, it's just like, like God looks at him and he says, is it good for you to be angry? You know, the implied answer is no, it's not, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, so like our feelings are not neutral. And when we, like we can get our feelings hurt because we, have listened to a bunch of gossip. We can get our feelings hurt because we, you know, in a metaphorical sense, because, you know, they're immaterial and all that. But, you know, you understand what I'm saying. Like, right. uh, like you can get yourself all upset and frustrated because you, you're jumping to conclusions, you're making poor assumptions, you're listening to poor information, you have unreasonable expectations. All those things are live and on the board. And so you can't just in some simplistic way come along and say, hey, yeah, I'm sorry you're hurt. It's like, no, I mean, like, is it good for you to be hurt? That's what God frequently says to individuals who are playing the hurt card. You know, mm -hmm. Is it good for you to be angry? Is it good for you to be hurt? Is it good for you to be, you know, often that hurt word is just code word for bitter and, you know, you had your idol thwarted and everything else. And so like the issue is what is true about this scenario? What is true about it? You know, like, do you actually have reasonable cause for distress in this moment? 
or is that unreasonable? And even if it's reasonable, is it in proportion to the nature of the offense, right? And so mm-hmm. there's not just like this simple, hey, I'm sorry, you're hurt kind of thing. That doesn't do anything. All it does is tell people that they're entirely justified in feeling everything they're feeling and acting the way that they're acting. Okay, so so don't say, I'm sorry, you're hurt. What if I say, all right, sorry you decided to let yourself be hurt. <laughs> <laughs> is that better is that more accurate uh yep <laughs> i say with a with a smirk on my face <laughs> yeah i mean <laughs> sorry you decided to be a victim <laughs> yeah i mean i i think you take god's approach you know like is it good for you to be angry about this you know oh, right. i'm not angry i'm hurt you know right. what's the difference you know right what's the- i it's funny it's funny you bring that up because um i actually had an interaction with um with a student of mine um really it's it's kind of been like a prolonged one um where uh it's it's been an issue you know they constantly uh get themselves in trouble because uh because of what someone else is doing um that you know is close by to them and and um that that student's actions will get on this student's actions nerves and then it ends up making making the student angry and they respond in some way that inevitably is going to get them in trouble and i've had to have several conversations where i say you know hey look when you let when you let yourself become angry at other people's actions who's in control of you at that point right and and what i'm trying to get them to understand is that uh that they're not in control anymore if if someone else can do something consistently and make you angry, make you feel like you're a victim, make you feel like you've been wronged in some way, and and it needs to be, uh, there needs to be justice for you. Then ultimately, like I don't really think you're the one in control of your own actions. I think you're letting someone else be in, in control, sure. right? And and um, so I think that I think there's some. I think there's something to be said about the person, like we've been saying, I think there's something to be said about the person who can go into a situation and and say, hey, look, all right, even if there is a legitimate uh, wrong done to me in some form or fashion, you know, I'm willing to say, like, I'm not going to let that define me. Yeah, I mean, the fruit of the Spirit is like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. And once you get that victim label, you put that on a situation, like people, like there's no category for fruit of the Spirit at that point anymore. Mm -hmm. It's just like, but hey, wait a minute, like... um, like, do, do, did you see Jesus walking around basically just complaining about all the ways in which his disciples hurt his feelings? And Right. Busting? But it's like, no, I mean, like, you, you still have a responsibility to have love, joy, peace, even in difficult situations, you know. And, like, the nature of the offense shouldn't be, like, so personal. It's not about you. It's about God. Like, and it's about his glory. You know, right. for most people, like, that's where, like, the, the, the whole the church hurt me kind of thing. It's just like... You wonder, like, even if in the situations where there's a legitimate concern, it's like, why is this so important to you? Like, have you never learned to accept wrongdoing in your life? Right. Yeah, like I mean, you, Proverbs tells us, you know, it's it's a man's glory to overlook an offense. Yeah, if you've never learned to overlook an offense, you've never learned to mis, be mistreated. Like, even Paul says, it, like, why not, brothers, why not let yourself be defrauded rather than going to court to sue someone, Right. Like, mm-hmm. and so there's this whole, I, like, in the Bible, like, consistent teaching of just let yourself be defrauded. Like, like, blessed are you when you are persecuted, despitefully used, for great is your reward in heaven. I mean, like, think about that and think about this church victim culture thing that we're talking about. And it's just, like, in that moment, you should be, like, if you really are being despitefully used, you should be rejoicing and exceedingly glad because great is your reward in heaven. And what we think is, like, the appropriate response is just to wallow in a ball and just refuse to go to church for months and months at a time because you're so damaged and you're so hurt. It's like, no, the appropriate response was to rejoice and to be exceedingly glad, (laughs) okay? Mm -hmm. That was the appropriate response, but you can't even say that because it sounds so crazy to people because they have no category of suffering for righteousness sake. And like the problem though is like, you know, like their marriages go that way too. Their relationships go that way too. They've never learned to suffer for righteousness sake. They've never learned like to, 
do good to those who persecute you and despitefully use you. Like if your enemy hungers, feed them. If they thirst, give them drink. For in so doing, you'll reap coals of fire on their head. Like they really are like all about them, you know? And so like, I'm not trying to say there's no place for grief and sadness and everything else, but it shouldn't be the self-focused, self-pitying kind of sadness. That's right, like, all-consuming. Yeah, like where, you know, I can't believe people were mean to me and didn't, you know, they were so mean to me and it just so hurtful. And it's just like, oh, come on, like, you know, how do you, like, how do you live life in a fallen world, you know? And the problem is they don't, you know? The problem is that once you start going down that road, it's just like you just, broken relationship after broken relationship after broken relationship because everything is just so personal and you have to be validated and you have to be affirmed and you have to be told, you know, you're wonderful. And, and it's just like, that isn't like the path to peace and love and joy and long suffering. Like, think right. of, like long suffering, right? That's not long suffering. That's like copying a victim person personality. You know, that's not self control, control of your emotions. And, you know, like ultimately, you know, like what people should be doing in these scenarios is grieving that God's purposes are not fulfilled. You know, it's about his mm-hmm. kingdom come, his will being done. It's not about us, man. Like, it, like we need to get our eyes off of ourselves. And, right. you know, like, you know, for Paul, like when you see Paul, like he's crying over the state of the church because he loves these people more than he loves himself and he doesn't want them to go to hell, you know? Right. Like, like it's not about him. It's not about, oh, you guys didn't, you know, you guys are treating me bad, you know? And like hurt. Paul literally wishes that he could go to hell so that his, right. so that his Jewish brothers would avoid hell. I mean, that's it, how much he loves so people. so far <laughs> from that, man, like in this kind of discussion that it's not even funny you know, so I mean, I think that there are legitimate situations where church leaders can let people down and fail, but like you should, like man, you should be praying for that person who did that, and like so grieved for them, mm-hmm. you know. And it should be about like grief for them because you love them and you care about them and you're so concerned for them, more than it's just like how dare you, you know, treat right. me this way. And, and imagine you're never if Jesus, in the right when you're that way, man. Right. Ima- imagine if Jesus had the same response to us, right. you know, like, like we, we sin against God. We totally reject, uh, all of his authority. Uh, imagine if, instead of saying, Hey, in spite of all this, I'm going to send my son to be crushed in your place. He's like, well, you know what? They wronged me, you know, right. like I'm going to let them get exactly right. what they deserve. Father, he would have, and he would have been totally justified in doing that. And he didn't do it. Right. Right. I so, mean, but that's not like you read through the New Testament. You don't see, you don't see this like pitying self focused, right. like, uh, you know, you guys are so mean to me and you never follow me very well. And all you want me to do is magic tricks for you. And, <laughs> you know, like, like even the times where he's like, you know, couldn't you, just, you know, pray with me for an hour? The reason why he's saying that is because they literally just boasted of their loyalty and faithfulness to him. Right. And he's saying, he's trying to let them know that they're like, they're going to all be scattered, you know, this night. Right. And, you know, none of them are going to stick with him. And he's doing that for their benefit, not for his. It's not Mm -hmm. like, oh, you know, you guys let me down and I was depending on you and you betrayed me and how dare you, you know? Right. Whenever God's mourning, it's, he's not mourning himself. He's mourning us. Right. All right. Like when G- when Jesus says, I would have gathered you as a uh, hen gathers her brood, you right. know, like talking about Israel. I mean, he's, he's literally mourning the hardness of their heart. He, he's not, mourning, yeah, but he, it's not like, it's not self-focused. It's not self-pitying. It's none of that. And, and so, right. but that has to go into this kind of conversation to where like, you can even have like legitimate situations where leaders fail and fail big time. But it's not like, you know, there, there isn't this just category of just, you know, everyone is so mean and they treated me so bad and I'm just so damaged and so wounded and so broken. And so, you know, it's just like, it's not a thing, man. It's not a thing, you know. So, you know, that's not to say that everyone, you know, has the spiritual maturity to be there instantaneously and you need to just like go in and be absolutely callous to that. But like you have to have some mechanism to say, Hey, we've like lost sight of like what we're doing here, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think when, whenever you have a discussion about people being hurt by the church, I think people probably have in their mind a pretty good idea of what it is that the church might've done 
and normally it, it it typically involves some sort of you know quote unquote abuse of power right um what if you were to if you were to use the phrase like we are uh people hurting the church i don't know that everyone would immediately have something pop into their mind as an example of that so so could you give us some examples of what like spe- like specific examples of what a church member hurting the church might look like i mean you know when you like uh take your own self-centered preferences and read them into the church and like so i mean i i, I there's plenty of scenarios where you know a church member doesn't like something that the pastor is teaching and you know basically goes on some crusade to discredit the pastor and you know, uh, turn everyone against them and turns to gossip and complaining and to slander and to all that, you know, based on some sort of misunderstanding, you know. So, I mean, there's been plenty of situations that I could think of where individuals didn't like something that I was saying and it's just like they didn't read it. It's there, you know, they just don't understand it. And so, I mean, those are scenarios like to where like a church member can do a lot of harm, can do a lot of damage. Like, uh, you know, church member has certain expectations about like, um, how the church should be run, you know, or church, like how it should operate, you know? So if, you know, like, the, you know, a lot of big churches train people to think that you know, they need to have ministries for every age and every stage and all these programs and all these events and, you know, that kind of stuff. And a church member can go into a church that isn't doing all that, you know, it's just faithfully teaching the Bible, you know, uh, equip feeding the saints, you know, mobilizing for mission, that kind of stuff. You can go in there mm-hmm. with all these expectations about what you think should be happening and all the, you know, a lot of like the you know, church shopper focus is like event focus. And so people want more events, you know, uh, more activities, more things, you know, more things to do, you know, give us a children's church, give us a, which is an oxymoron, you know, uh, give us all this stuff, you know, like, uh, you know, we want, uh, you know, entire singles ministries. We want all these women's ministries. We want all this stuff. Like we want like, and what that means is just like extra like teaching that's specifically geared towards certain demographics. And they can go into churches that aren't doing that kind of thing and just cause a lot of problems and basically level a bunch of accusations. And it's just like, hey, this is like, like are these biblical expectations or are these just things that your big church did that were maybe wise, maybe unwise, you know? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people can get like real event focused. Um, And then, yeah, you know, a lot of it's like related to kids and stuff like that too. You know, so you have a lot of parents who are basically in the process of losing their kids to the public education system. And then they look at the church and I mean, they basically turn their kids over to pagans, you know, for eight hours a day, you know, their whole life. And then they end up pagans and then they're like, hey, church, you know, I never have Bible studies with them. I never pray with them, but it's your job to fix them. So basically, you know, go play baseball with them and maybe slip in 10 minutes of Jesus talk with them and, you know, that'll do it. And it's like, you know, it's like if a church doesn't want to go that route to entertain their pagan kids in that way, then it's just like, well, the church hates kids and the church is like failing them. And it's just like, you know, our job isn't to entertain pagans, <laughs> you know, right. like it's not, you know, so like there's, I mean, there's just like, uh, I think a lot of like church shopper kind of expectations that you can have there. Or like when you just like feel like you have some sort of gift that you have, like whether it be teaching or whatever, like you have these ideas about like how to revolutionize everything and fix everything. And then you come into a church and want them to do all your plans and, most of which are just nowhere to be found in the Bible, you know? Uh, so, I mean, there's, there's just examples like that, just gossip and slander and discontent and complaining and, you know, your normal stuff. And so like that, like that isn't helpful. And, you know, you, right. you are going to war against Christ's bride. And, you know, I, I, you know, been at churches where like, you know, someone gets on a, you know, um, kick that, you know, this is the only translation that's, divinely inspired or something like that and then they <laughs> yeah. go to a church that's teaching out of a different translation and then, then they go to war against it and it's just like like what are you doing you know like uh like just go to a church that does that you know why are you trying to change that you know you know on the front end what they're doing you know they're not doing that so 
you know, and that's been like, there's just things like that that are, um, the, but I mean, I, you can multiply examples. I mean, I could give, you know, tons of personal examples, but I'm trying not to, to, to protect the guilty, you know, too. <laughs> but, um, um, okay. So, so those are a bunch of examples of ways that, um, people can hurt the church itself. I guess in closing, why don't we talk about... Well, the about, truth, though, is that, you know, Christ will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, and you can, you're not going to destroy, like, the true church, and God's going to get the churches back, you know, you might... Right. Uh, you know, you might, um, like, ultimately, God's sovereign, and he's in control, and, you know, he, everything happens for a reason, but, you know, his sheep will hear his voice, and they'll follow him, and, you know, the, he, he's got a building project, he's going to finish it. So we can rest confidence of him, but there there are people who seek to do it harm and are right. you know actively doing everything they can to destroy it, hinder the church. Yeah, I mean it's funny that you know Joy, Julie Roy's uh, you know went on a crusade against MacArthur, and now she recently got canceled, uh, and, and he's still going. You know, so but, <laughs> did she get canceled? I didn't know. Well, yeah, that. I mean she basically told a story in her uh, you know, book, 2017 book about her. Um, basically falling in love with a girl and uh, um, uh, basically falling in love with a girl that like a college girl that she was ministering to and then you know basically um, violating all the principles of uh, the Me Too culture and her, the way that she blamed the girl for it and everything else and then so now all the you know survivor folks are on on her case about it but um, it's funny. God, God has uh, God has his servants back. Live by the sword, die by the sword. I guess. Yep. Um, okay. So, in closing, why don't why don't you just walk us through Tim some uh, stereos on the other end? Some. Uh, well, I was gonna say, you know, like basically, yeah, like a a proper way. So, you're a church member at a church, right? You feel like the church has done something uh you know that's it's hurt your feelings or it's made you upset you feel like you're not valued you feel like you're not heard um you know uh whatever it is you have a it, you got a problem with something the church did you know you listed a bunch of examples of like what people actually do and and how it can um uh, you know uh, hinder the church in certain ways, not ultimately, obviously, but um, so why don't you just kind of walk us through what should the general, you know, response be from someone who feels like they are, uh, you know, hurt by the church in some way? Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I guess you have to maybe talk about scenarios that could happen. Okay. But, you know, I, uh, you know, I've, I've been, you know, I've, you know, I could just talk about myself for a minute, but I mean, I, I've been in churches that <laughs> haven't been precisely biblical, you know, <laughs> as far as it goes. So most churches are somewhat of a mess, man. And so like, there's like categories of doctrinal error that you have to think through. Like, is this something I can put up with? You know, is this something that, yeah. so like, like you think in terms of like, churches have every church has doctrinal error to some degree and if they knew what it was they'd probably change it for the most part you know but some people are hardened in it and that's the way it goes so you think there's doctrinal error um and you know part of what you want to do is you want to go into a church and like learn what they believe about things and prioritize their doctrinal stances on things and you know uh, so like an informed church member is a good church member you go into a church you might want to know on the front end what do they teach and you know, churches that have better statements of faith that are longer and more comprehensive may help you avoid a lot of that kind of thing. I mean, if I were to like go to a PCA church or a Presbyterian church of some sort, I think that I could go to some, but I wouldn't go on some crusade against believers' baptism or uh, infant baptism as a individual who does believers' baptism. It'd just be one of those things where it's just like, all right, we're on a different planet here. Uh, can I overlook this for the sake of broader faithfulness? And, you know, there's probably plenty of Presbyterian churches I'd feel closer to than plenty of your Baptist churches, right? So mm -hmm. I think part of like how you deal with doctrinal dis, dis, uh, things like that is to learn on the front end what are their stances and try to figure out like in your own mind, in your own way, what are non-negotiables that I see in the Bible, 
you know, and, and, and that may be a little bit subjective, but you need to know that beforehand. What are the non-negotiables for me? And have those kind of conversations with leaders like beforehand, like so you're not surprised, you know, about kind of what you're going to find and ask very specific questions in whatever membership pr- process that you have. So part of it's that. Uh, um, now related to like usefulness, a lot of people get like really frustrated with churches because they don't feel like they're being used appropriately. Okay. They can't start their, you know, puppet ministry. Can't start their puppet ministry, man. Like what? You know, puppets are creepy, but I'll leave that aside for a minute. Um, what is it? Puppet phobia, whatever that is. I have it. Um, but um, <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, I, I went to seminary and I, you know, think I have a gift of teaching that many older, wiser people have affirmed in me. And I don't think I made it up in my own brain. Uh, you know, but if there was a scenario where I was like at a church and I have no way to utilize that gift, you know, I, I, I can imagine getting restless and thinking to myself, man, I, I think I want to, if God will open a door to pursue a place that would allow me to be more useful with that spiritual gift, like there's nothing wrong with that. But at the same time, it's like, you can't just like, you know, you can't like, I mean, like someone like me, like, let's say, you know, I were to, um, you know, our church were to shut down or whatever, you know, like something like that, like a uh, terrorist were to bomb the place and everyone dies, but me, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> right. So you would go on it. You, you would go on like a John Wick kind of rampage. <laughs> <laughs> imagine that kind of scenario. Right. <laughs> but imagine that kind of scenario. Like what would it, what would you do? I mean, you'd have to go and just find a faithful church somewhere and they don't know you, you know? So not the John Wick. Not rampage. the John Wick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they don't know you, man. Like they don't know you from anywhere. Like they don't know you. They don't know anything about you, you know? And like what you say is like, Hey, you know, I've been a pastor at certain places. You know, I've taught Bible study in certain places. Like you don't know me. I'm happy to, you know, be useful. If you need anyone at any point, you can, you know, I'm open to that. But I mean, like, my goodness, like you don't just get all frustrated and bent out of the shape and, you know, angry at them. It's just like it, like it takes time to build trust. And when you put people in positions of authority and leadership and you don't know them very well, they can do a lot of harm. They can undermine right. you every week in their lessons. Like it's just like a mess. You you don't lay hands on people hastily, the Bible says. So you need to have some sort of realistic expectations about what that looks like. And if you're at a place- it that, might be. Oh, go ahead, sorry, go keep going. I, I was going to say, it might be, you know, a normal response to say, like, hey, wait a minute. What do you mean your entire church died and you were leading it? <laughs> You're the only one, the, the lone Hang survivor. On. Hang on. Huh? <laughs> We've got some questions for you. How did you survive and everyone else didn't, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, you see, I uh, had COVID. Why, were, week. Why, why did the, ter- how did the terrorists find you? Yeah, <laughs> you know? well, you know, I tipped them out to it, you know. But no, I mean, like, uh, I, you know, you, in that kind of scenario, I'm just trying to say, like, you know, there's times where you just, like, you feel restless and you feel like you'd like to be more used. But you need to pray for that. Ask God to open an opportunity. If God wants you to have opportunities, he'll give them to you. And ultimately, you know, that there might be a scenario where you say, hey, there's a greater opportunity to serve in this other like-minded church. And there's nothing wrong with taking that, but you should be able to do that without all the hard feelings, without all the emotional baggage, without like, you should, right. you should be able to do that in a way that your church leadership thinks like, Hey, we're happy to send you out. You're right. We don't have a place for you here. And like, there's a better place, you know, there's an opportunity here. And without it just being just like, I'm so mad at you and you know, everything else. And so like, you know, that. so I, I talked about like just doctrinal like differences, like, on the front end, figure out what you're talking about, what you're getting yourself into. If there's, like, if you find out after you're there, you know, you might do the approach I did where you talk to the pastor about it. You realize it's not going to be something that's changed. You know, you wait them out for a little bit. If it's not very significant, if it's just something you don't, like, you think is so significant, you don't, that uh, was inappropriate. You don't have to cause a bunch of division and be divisive and, you know, do all that. You can just, find somewhere else, man, you know? So, like, you know, and I'm not trying to say that there's not like a, a place for public rebuke and, and all that, but you do have to think about where you're at, you know, with those things too. And, and like, um, so, you know, so I, I think, uh, there are, 
Like if you start noticing someone like shift into doctrinal error, you know, your pastor's going woke. I think you need to have conversations with them. You need to confront them. You need to like go Matthew 18 with it, you know, bring, bring an accusation against it. You need like there, there are steps and ultimately like they refuse to listen to you. And you know, like it's not a priority for the church. It might be that you just you find somewhere else to go. So, you know, I think, um, there's a variety, variety of situations like that. You know, if it's just about like, you know, ministries that you think should exist and preferences that you have, you really do need to go to the Bible and ask yourself, like, is this like concern? Is it a sin issue? Is it a wisdom issue or is it a preference issue? Right. And I'm not responsible to lead the church if I'm not in that position. Like, am I, like, is this wisdom? Is it sin or is it a preference? And a lot of people are just making their preferences like these, like, non-negotiable you better validate it or else and, and you know a lot of them are you know even wisdom issues where it's just like hey you know like there's like a lot of different principles in the bible that are coming to the head one kind of issue and you might want to hear them out a little bit and not just get you know you know think to yourself that like your opinion about the wisest course of action in any given situation is directly right. from the mouth of god you know so i mean i think that there's a there's a lot of different situations you you can have, but I mean, let's say that the church really is in the wrong, you know, and they're handling things poorly, and like this is a you know a real scenario where they're just running raw shot over everyone and cramming down their throat on biblical ideas. I, you know, there you can pray for them, you know, and you, you you know often like with those kind of guys, like they go through churches every three years, you know because they're church climbers and they're looking to the next one and like, you can wait them out too, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> like, uh, you don't have to leave right away. You can wait them out and, you know, wait for the next one and see if like the next one's any better, you know, but you can, you know, there's patience, man, and praying and praying and praying. And, you know, if you haven't been praying for your church intentionally and specifically about an issue for a long period of time, you're probably not going to handle it. Right. 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 Um, well, I think uh, that's probably a good place for us to end on. I really wanted to get to some good, like, all right, what do we do instead? So um, before we end the episode, Tim, is there anything that you've got that maybe we didn't cover or you want to clarify or just expand on a little more? Sure. Yeah. I, you know, I think the, the idea of um, just to summarize some of the things we talked about, I think, there, there are clearly situations where you know church leaders abuse their authority and abuse their power, and uh, sometimes in significant ways. And uh, when they do, like it, it's obviously, I, th- I think it's obvious that um, particularly immature believers should be very unsettled by that. And you know, I trusted you, and I, you know, thought you're giving me the truth, and you know, it went wrong, and I'm not quite sure what to do with that. And so I'm, I'm not trying to say that anyone who's even remotely unsettled by that or put off by that it's just automatically inherently in the wrong but at the same time we we overuse the victim language and we need to like go move on to maturity and we need to be other centered and and not just me focused and 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 all that and so even in situations where church leaders let you down in a very significant way like you have to understand that god will god's going to hold them to account and like uh a few should become teachers because there's a stricter judgment and yet that should chill your blood, you know, and it should free you up from like this, like, op, like this expectation that you, it's like up to you to fix everything. It's like, sometimes it's not, you know, then God's going to like, we, you know, we, we, de- we're living in a society right now that demands instantaneous judgment. Uh, and justice and perfect justice in this life. And there are some times where you just don't have the information you need. And there are some times right. where it's just like, you just have to wait. God's going to, like one day, every secret of every man's thoughts is going to be revealed and ultimate justice will be done. And it may not happen in this life, but it will, you know, happen eventually. And, you know, this is about God's church and God will, you know, like, you know, if there are those things, they'll come out, you know, there's a reason why, you know, Mars church, Mars Hill imploded the way that it did, you know, and um, what was funny is that the reasons that actually imploded at times were not the reasons that you would think a biblical faithful church would be. And I mean, that's just a funny scenario where it's just like, man, that church went under for that, you know, like mm-hmm. there's so many other problems and it went under for that. And like, my goodness, you know, but like, um, you know, nothing that is hidden will not be revealed one day. And 
you know, God, God will you know, ultimately um, justice, true justice will be done. Um, but the best thing we can do is just you know love the church, and um, you know like there's never a good reason to separate ourselves from the church. Like there's never a good reason. There's never a morally justified reason. You know, the God's composed the body in such a way that each part supplies what's lacking. And we're all members of the body. And like, if you're a lung laying on the ground, you're not getting any oxygen. You know, I tell people this when they um, are considering church membership. They're like, hey, you know, I'm just trying to be careful. And it's like, yeah, you know, you'd be careful all day long. But like, the thing is, like, if you're a lung laying on the ground and you have a choice between a smoker body and nobody, Right you know what, you better take the smoker body because like, yeah, you'll get cancer with that. But you know what, you're going to like decay if you're laying on the ground without any, you know, blood and arteries and veins and everything else. So you're in a worse state, like uh, when you're just sitting there apart, isolated from the body, like that's much worse than being in the smoker body that you're so afraid of, you know. And like, it's not the worst thing in the world to be defrauded and despitefully used and persecuted. Like it really isn't, you know. Right. And if you can't learn to do that in a church setting, you're not going to do that in your relationships either, you know. So, like, it's, we need to put some kind of perspective on some of this too. Um, right. That's helpful. Yeah. I think one thing, just kind of thinking back on this conversation, one thing that it seems like it's safe to say is it would it would do everyone involved a lot of good if, if everyone just kind of approached these issues with, with as much humility as possible and as much thought about the other people involved, um, thought and prayer and uh, towards the other people involved in the situation as possible. Um, and, and I think that's uh, probably for a lot of us in a lot of different ways, whether, you know, um, uh, at, you know, past points in our life, or maybe even for some listening right now, that's that's a good reminder to say, "Hey, I, I need to go and I need to repent of that." No, I'm not thinking about the other people. Uh, I, I'm only thinking about myself and the the wrong that I I think I've experienced. So, I'm really appreciative of that. Hopefully, that's been helpful for you guys, and uh, this is stuff that you can apply. Um, not just apply for yourselves, but even take what we're talking about and then use the, that knowledge to minister to the people in your life. Uh, and it should who, really, it really should lead us to like know well, what is a biblical church and go to the Bible to figure that out. Right, like what what right. what is what am I supposed to be looking for here? And what am I you know what are the signs of a biblical church? And that should push you into the Bible there to right. figure that out, not just the expectations you have from you know church shopper culture. Yeah, certainly have, you know, uh, in order for us to really navigate this well, we have to actually know, you know, what God expects of a church and what he doesn't expect of a church so that we can align our expectations with his instead of the other way around. Right. Um, so hopefully that's been helpful for you guys. Again, we want to thank all of you for uh, taking the time out of your day to listen to us. Hopefully it's helpful and it equips you guys for the works of ministry. Uh, we thank you for the support, and we look forward to having you guys on the next one. This has been another episode of Bible Bashed. We hope you have been encouraged and blessed through our discussion. We thank you for all your support and ask you to continue to like and subscribe to Bible Bashed and share our podcast with your friends and on social media. Please reach out to us with your questions, pushback, and potential topics for us to discuss in future episodes at BibleBashedPodcast at gmail.com and consider supporting us through Patreon. If you would like to be Bible Bashed personally, then please know that we also offer free biblical counseling, which you can take advantage of by emailing us. Now, go boldly and obey the truth in the midst of a biblically illiterate world who will be perpetually offended by your every move.